Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Sullivan, and welcome to History in Games, a podcast where I play historical fiction games and talk about the real history behind the game. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the popular strategy JRPG Fire Emblem Three Houses, developed by Intelligent Systems and Koi Tecmo Games for the Nintendo Switch. I love this game. I've put about 170 hours into it, which is not hard to do thanks to the game's four separate story routes. While diving into the game's rich lore, I quickly realized it borrows heavily from the political history, style, and social hierarchy of medieval Europe, particularly the Holy Roman Empire. But surprise, during my historical research for this podcast, I found out the game is also heavily steeped in ancient antiquity, something I think many Fire Emblem fans may have missed. So before I tackle the similarities between Fire Emblem and medieval history, I thought it would be fun to start at the beginning and unravel the meaning of Fire Emblem Three Houses' super secret past. So assemble your units on the battlefield, O oh loyal followers of the Black Eagles, Blue Lions, and Golden Deer, and let's get started. Now, before we get into our history lesson, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that Fire Emblem Three Houses doesn't just take its cues from Western history. Much of its inspiration actually comes from an older Fire Emblem game called Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War, which, like Three Houses, includes a time skip and characters with divine bloodlines who went to school together. It's also heavily inspired by the celebrated literary work Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which is based on the rise and fall of three real Chinese kingdoms during the 3rd century BCE. If you're familiar with Koei Tecmo, that's not surprising to learn. After all, their flagship series, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and its spin-off, Dynasty Warriors, are both based off this famous epic. And you can see a lot of the novel's influence in Three Houses. There's a power struggle between three kingdoms, an emperor being manipulated by court officials, ten elite warriors, a battle near a red cliff, or in this case, a red canyon, etc., etc., but although Three Houses gives lots of nods to Chinese history and games of old, the costumes, items, names, locations, political ranks, religious hierarchy, and Western ideals are all squarely in the realm of late medieval Europe, while the game's backstory is deeply rooted in Western antiquity. And that is what we're going to talk about today. By the way, warning, from here on out, there will be massive spoilers for Fire Emblem Three Houses, so turn back now if you're still making your way through the story and want to be surprised. Are we good? Great. So, for those of you who have not played Fire Emblem Three Houses but don't mind spoilers, here's a very quick story summary to get you up to speed. In Fire Emblem Three Houses, you play a mercenary who unexpectedly finds themselves teaching at a prestigious officer's academy associated with a religious institution known as the Church of Seros. There, classes are divided up according to one of the three kingdoms students hail from, the Adrestian Empire, the Holy Kingdom of Fargus, and the Leicester Alliance. Under the watchful eye of the Archbishop Rhea, you help your students learn and grow and watch as friendships form. But when war breaks out between the three kingdoms, you'll be forced to choose a side, which means you'll end up fighting some of the very students you've come to know and love. How the story ends depends on the choices and friends you've made along the way. Now, the game takes place on the fictional continent of Fodlan, and this is important because as it turns out, there are two histories of Fodlan. The official church-sanctioned history, which I'll talk about in my next episode, and the secret, true history of Fodlan, which reveals itself the more you play the game. And it's in the game's secret hidden history where a lot of the most fascinating real-world history can be found. But in order to fully appreciate the significance of this hidden history, we need to quickly review what it is. That way, it's easier to understand the real history behind the game. So, let's do that. And remember, spoilers! So the real history of Fodlan goes something like this. Long ago, there was a series of wars between an evil group of technologically advanced humans known as the Agarthans and a race of magical divine beings known as the Nabataeans, who were the children of a goddess named Sothis. The Nabataeans managed to win the first war and drove the Agarthans underground. Full of vengeance, the Agarthans then sent a man named Nemesis to the Nabataean city of Xanadu to kill the mother of the Nabataeans, Sothis, in her sleep, 
so that her divine body could be dismembered and turned into a powerful weapon. Nemesis then used this weapon to kill many of the goddess's children, whose bodies in turn were used to create yet more divine weapons. The slaughter of the Nebataeans continued in this way until they were almost extinct. Finally, the Nebataean leader, known as the Immaculate One, encouraged the Nebataeans to fight fire with fire and create human super soldiers of their own. After many more decades of fighting, the Nabataeans were finally able to drive the Agarthans back underground, where the Agarthans built a secret, technologically advanced city called Shambhala, and have been plotting vengeance ever since. Meanwhile, in order to ensure humans never, ever, ever harm them again, the leader of the Nabataeans, now calling herself Seros, established a new religion, one that taught humans to love and worship Sothis. This religion would be known as the Church of Seros, and it would have influence over Fodlan for the next thousand years. Seros also helped establish a new human empire, called the Adrestian Empire, to help spread this new religion and act as a standing army against future Agarthan attacks. Oh, and it also allowed her to manipulate human behavior. Over the centuries, the war between the Agarthans and Nabataeans was forgotten and replaced with a new history, one that cast the Nabataeans as human saints who protected the land from evil and taught that humans with super soldier blood in them were in fact descendants of legendary heroes. Meanwhile, the very long-lived Nabataeans changed their identities so that the vengeful Agarthans couldn't easily find them, and Seros, once known as the Immaculate One, once again changed her name, this time to Rhea. And for a thousand years, nobody really thought to question any of this. Until one day, somebody did. Dun, dun, dun. And that's a very, very basic summary of the game's backstory. Believe it or not, there's even more to it. Pretty crazy, right? But did you know this fictional history incorporates a ton of real history? Specifically, the history of ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, ancient Nabataea, and even parts of the ancient Far East. In order to understand how that could possibly work, we need to take a closer look at the characters and locations found in Fire Emblem's backstory. So, let's start at the beginning, with the one thing that ties all the people and places of Fodlan together, Sothis. In Fire Emblem Three Houses, Sothis is the progenitor goddess of Fodlan, who helps your protagonist throughout the story and grants you the ability to turn back time whenever you make a mistake on the battlefield, and her name is pretty significant. You see, the name Sothis comes from the ancient Greek pronunciation of the name Sopdet, an ancient Egyptian goddess who was a personification of the brightest star in our night sky, Sirius, aka the Dog Star, so called on account of it being part of the constellation Canis Major, the Greater Dog. In ancient Egypt, Sothis, or Sopdet, was known as the bringer of the new year on account of the star's heliacal rising meaning its annual appearance in the dawn sky just before the yearly flooding of the Nile, which marked the beginning of the Egyptian civil calendar. Now, due to the progression of the equinoxes, today the star's heliacal rising occurs in August, but every 1,460 years it aligns with the summer solstice during the season known to the ancient Egyptians as Akhet, meaning inundation, a reference to the Nile floods. Because of this, Sothis, or Sobdet, was considered a particularly auspicious star. And since the star's rising occurred just as the Nile brought new life to Egypt, the goddess Sotet was associated with fertility and prosperity. And since the star's rising occurred just as the Nile brought new life to Egypt, the goddess Sotet was associated with fertility and prosperity. But what's interesting is that she was also associated with death and rebirth. The ancient Egyptians believed that since the dog star mysteriously disappeared every spring and then miraculously reappeared in the dawn sky 70 days later, that Sopdet must have been a sort of celestial guide for the deceased, one who prepared pharaohs for the afterlife by helping them navigate the underworld. Then, once the pharaohs were ready, she led the way to the heavens, where their souls became stars. This 70-day transition between death and rebirth was so symbolically important to the ancient Egyptians, they even synchronized the mummification process so that it took 70 days, the exact amount of time that the star Sirius, or Sothis, or Sopdet, remains hidden below the horizon. Stars were very important to the ancient Egyptians. 
Their pyramids and temples were aligned with the movement of the stars. And archaeologists have found coffins with star clocks drawn on the inside lid in order to help the deceased either find their way to the stars or instruct them on how to behave as a star. And in the ancient Egyptian astronomical text known as the Book of Newt, or more accurately as the Fundamentals of the Course of the Stars, Sothis's reliable movements were used as a model for the behavior of other star clusters, known as deacons. In short, Soptet was very important in the life and afterlife of ancient Egyptians. Now you may doubt that the Fire Emblem version of Sothis has much to do with an ancient Egyptian deity. After all, Sothis looks and acts more like Tiki from previous Fire Emblem games than a celestial fertility goddess associated with rebirth. But there's actually a lot of in-game evidence that the character is indeed based on her Egyptian counterpart. For a start, in the game, Sothis refers to herself as the beginning. This is a reference to her status as a progenitor goddess, i.e. the mother of the Nabataeans. Life begins with her. And life in ancient Egypt began with the rising of the star Sothis, just before the flooding of the life-giving Nile. So there's one similarity. But there's actually a more direct astronomical correlation. According to Fire Emblem lore, there's a bright shiny star that rises and sets every year in Fodlan. That star's name is the Blue Sea Star, a heavenly body associated with the goddess Sothis that sets in the month of the ethereal moon and rises in the month of the Blue Sea Moon. When the star reappears in the sky, the people of Fodlan celebrate its return with a ritual known as the Goddess's Rite of Rebirth. This fictional ritual reflects a very real Egyptian festival known as the Coming of Sopdet, which celebrated Sopdet's reappearance in the dawn sky and involved feasting and community gatherings. Another interesting fact, the real-life star, which has a bluish-white appearance, was sometimes known by the Egyptians as the Fair Star of the Waters, giving credence to the name Blue Sea Star in Fire Emblem. Now, not everyone has or had such positive feelings towards Sothis. In Fire Emblem, one of Sothis's nicknames is Fell Star. It's never really clear why Sothis is called Fell Star by her enemies, but the developers are most likely referring to the fact that some ancient cultures believe Sothis to be unlucky or destructive on account of it appearing during the hottest, driest, or muggiest days of the year. For example, in ancient China, Sothis, called the Celestial Wolf, denoted plunder and invasion. In ancient Greece, the star's scorching luminosity was thought to drive people mad, and anyone affected by its power was thought to be astroboletos, literally starstruck. The ancient Romans were so afraid of its power that they made sacrifices during the star's heliacal setting in spring, in the hopes of avoiding a bad harvest when the star reappeared in summer. So by this logic, the game's villains calling Sothis Falstar actually makes sense. But the biggest similarity between the character Sothis and the Egyptian goddess is that both are closely associated with death and rebirth. In the game, Sothis is killed in her sleep by an Agartha named Nemesis, and her immortal heart and bones are fashioned into a powerful weapon. Later, this weapon is recovered by the Nabataeans, and Sothis's heart is placed into the body of a mortal, allowing Sothis to be reborn, or at least for her conscience to be reawakened. This story of death, dismemberment, and rebirth closely resembles the story of the ancient Egyptian god Osiris, whose wife Isis was often associated with, or even conflated with, Sopdet. By the way, Isis means throne, as in the throne of the pharaohs. And it's interesting to note that in Fire Emblem, Sothis is often depicted sitting on a throne. At any rate, Osiris was said to be Egypt's first pharaoh, and was responsible for introducing civilization and agriculture to mankind. According to Egyptian belief, after Osiris was killed by his jealous brother Set, the latter dismembered his body and scattered it around in the hopes it would never be found. Eventually, the pieces were located by Osiris' wife, Isis, who put him back together and revived him just long enough to conceive their son, Horus. After that, Osiris made his way to the afterlife and became god of the underworld, while part of his soul was immortalized in the heavens as a constellation Orion or rather, possibly as one of the brightest stars in Orion, Rigel. And if you compare Osiris' story to the story of Sothis from Fire Emblem, there seems to be a pretty clear connection there. But that's not all. I mentioned earlier that the key to the character Sothis' rebirth is her heart. Is there any historical or cultural significance to that? Yes. You see, in ancient Egypt, the heart was thought to be the source of human wisdom, 
emotion, memory, the soul, and even someone's personality. In fact, to the ancient Egyptians, life started when a person's heart was formed by a drop of blood taken from the mother's heart at conception. Simply put, it represented a person's very existence. Therefore, the heart was the only organ not removed during mummification so that the deceased could take it with them to the Hall of Judgment. There, the god of the underworld Osiris, along with 42 judges, including the goddess of universal harmony and balance, Ma'at, would watch as the deceased's heart was placed on a scale that would reveal whether the person had led a good life or a bad life. If the heart was as light as the feather of Ma'at placed on the other side of the scale, it meant the person had led a good life, and the judges would allow them to enter the field of reeds, an eternal paradise. If the heart was heavy, then the person had lived a bad life, and their heart was eaten by the personification of divine retribution, the goddess Amit, at which point the person ceased to exist. The Egyptians were terrified of this fate and worried their heart would tattle on them during judgment. So when people were buried, they often had a stone amulet known as a heart scarab placed on their mummy with a spell written on it, asking the heart not to speak against them during judgment. In short, the heart was an essential part of one's rebirth, and it's no surprise that in Fire Emblem Three Houses, the heart of Sothis is key to her rebirth. And finally, there are a couple of aesthetic qualities that link the character Sothis to her Egyptian counterpart. If you look at the costume designs for characters associated with Sothis and Fire Emblem, you'll notice they all have star-like patterns somewhere on their clothes or accessories, including Sothis herself. And historically, the Egyptians almost always depicted Sothis as a human figure with a five-pointed star over her head. There's also a connection regarding Sothis's hair color. In Fire Emblem, Sothis has green hair because, well, she's basically just Tiki from previous Fire Emblem games. But her hair color wouldn't be out of place in ancient Egypt. Thousands of years ago, Egyptian nobility loved wearing hair extensions and wigs, and it was not unheard of to dye their wigs red, green, or even blue. In fact, one of the most famous ancient Egyptian queens, Nefertiti, was known to don blue-colored wigs. So, there you go. In conclusion, it's pretty clear and cool that the Fire Emblem Sothis is indeed tied to the ancient Egyptian goddess Sopdet. But before I wrap things up, I wanted to quickly mention that Sothis isn't the only one representing ancient Egypt in Fire Emblem Three Houses. The character Sedith, a worshipper of the goddess Sothis and a higher up in the church of Seros, has an Egyptian sounding name as well. It's very close to the name of the god Set, also translated as Seth or Setish, who is the god of chaos, sandstorms, and deserts. Now, Fire Emblem Sedith is not particularly stormy or chaotic. In fact, he's rather calm and organized and protective of his family, unlike Set, who, as I mentioned before, killed his brother Osiris. So the link seems a bit hazy. But believe it or not, Set was not always portrayed as evil. He may have originally been a benevolent god from Upper Egypt, one who protected the sun god Ra and whose name was invoked in sexy love spells. But there's a better contender for the etymological root of the name Seteth. Seteth's name is very close to the name Setet, yet another Egyptian deity associated with the star Sothis. Sedet, or Sedis, or Sadis, was known as the guardian of Egypt's southern frontier, as well as a goddess of war, hunting, and fertility. And at least one of her temples was built in alignment with the movement of the star Sothis. And so, if Sedith is named after Setet, that means we have yet another link to the brightest star in our night sky, which means we have a really cool naming convention going on in three houses. But wait, there's more! We have another character whose name is linked to Sothis, and her name is Seros. But in order to fully understand that, we'll need to move from ancient Egypt to ancient Greece. And we'll do that in the next episode of our mini Fire Emblem series. At any rate, guys, questions, comments, suggestions, let me know by emailing me at meganhistory, M-E-G-N-H-I-S-T-O-R-Y at gmail.com. Hit me up on Twitter at Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N underscore I-G-N, or follow me on Instagram at Celtic underscore Queen underscore Meg. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Bye!